Thank you. You're very kind. Is this working? Is this microphone? Excellent. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so grateful for you all showing up on such a cold evening uh, and uh, expressing your creativity by being frustrated outside the door and all your patience. So thank you. Uh, it's a wonderful turnout, but I actually wanted to talk to you about an evening where the turnout was far bigger than this, 1,400 people. It was 1975, the Cologne Opera House, and the event was a late night concert of improvised jazz by the American <coughs> jazz musician Keith Jarrett. The whole thing had been arranged by someone who's younger than most of you, in fact younger than I suspect almost all of you, uh, a German teenager called Vera Brandes, just 17 years old. Now how, how was it that Vera Brandes had arranged for the Cologne Opera House to host the great Keith Jarrett? Well, she just loved jazz. She loved jazz, and she thought there wasn't enough jazz in Cologne, and so she became Germany's youngest concert promoter, and she started arranging gigs, and almost immediately, the, the opportunity of a lifetime, Keith Jarrett, the Opera House, late night, improvised jazz, perfect. What could be better? There was just one problem. But Vera didn't know about the problem that, that afternoon as she walked out onto the stage of the Cologne Opera House. She looked out over the empty auditorium, the, the room lit by the dim green glow of the emergency exit sign. She didn't realize there was a problem as she introduced Keith Jarrett to the piano that he was going to play just a few hours later. She, she only began to get an inkling of the problem when Keith looked at the piano extremely suspiciously. <coughs> Played a couple of notes. He went over and he muttered in the ear of his producer, Manfred Eicher. And Manfred Eicher comes over, plays a couple of notes, goes back. Talk. You can imagine how Vera's feeling at this point. That her heart is sinking. <coughs> this is supposed to be the best day of her life. And then Manfred Eicher comes over to Vera and says, if you don't get a new piano, Keith can't play. Now, Jarrett wasn't being fussy. I mean, he had, he had specified that he wanted a Bosendorfer piano, and it was a Bosendorfer piano. But unfortunately, the clue's in the name, Cologne Opera House. They're into their opera, not so into the jazz. And so the piano removal guys, they found a... Bosendorfer in some little rehearsal studio somewhere, and they'd stuck it on the stage. And it was the wrong piano. It was, it was beaten up, black keys were sticking, the white keys were out of tune, the pedals didn't work, all the felt had worn away uh, in, in the, the high notes, so the treble had a really harsh, tinny kind of register. And um, most importantly of all, it wasn't a grand piano, it wasn't a concert scale piano. So Vera Brandes later said, yeah, it was like, it was a tiny piano. It was like half a piano. And that meant that it didn't have the volume to reach the back of the Cologne Opera House. It was unplayable. And so Keith Jarrett did, I think, what most of us would do in those circumstances, if any of us could actually imagine being in those circumstances. He said he wasn't going to play, and he left. So Vera immediately jumps on the phone. She's trying to arrange a replacement very quickly becomes apparent that the only thing she can do is to get a piano tuner in, and at least, so, at least he can get the thing in tune, but he can't fix all the other problems with this piano. It's a really bad instrument. So Vera's only option at this point is what she does next. She walks out of the Cologne Opera House. She finds Keith Jarrett. He's sitting in his car. It's raining. She taps on the window. She begs him. She begs him to play. She's just a kid. There are 1,400 people coming. They're going to kill her. Please play. And Keith Jarrett looks out at this bedraggled German teenager. And he takes pity on her. He says, never forget. Only for you. And so, a few hours later... Keith Jarrett walks out onto the stage in front of a packed auditorium. 
He sits down at the unplayable piano and he begins. And within a few moments, it becomes apparent that something magical is happening. So Jarrett's avoiding these harsh, tinny upper notes. He's, he's sticking to the middle of the keyboard, the middle tones, which gives the piece the soothing ambient quality. But because the piano is so small, he also has to give it a bit of extra welly. He's standing up and he's, he's twisting and he's pounding down on the keys. And he also sets up these rolling, repetitive riffs in the bass. He's trying to get enough resonance to, to carry to the back of the hall. And that tension between the, the soothing ambient tones and the, the force with which Keith is hitting the piano, it's, it's electrifying. I mean, it is an absolutely mesmerizing piece of music. Not to let you in on too many family secrets, but two of my children were born while we were listening to this music. And it is amazing. <laughs> My wife doesn't like to listen to this talk. It brings back too many memories. <laughs> now, it's not just me and my wife who like this music. It's the most popular solo jazz album in history. It's the most popular piano album in history. It's called The Cone Concert. Now, you might ask yourself, why was the... Why was there a recording of this at all? Well, it turns out that Jarrett and Eicher decided they were going to record this concert because they wanted documentary evidence of what a musical catastrophe sounds like. <laughs> so they could play it to all future concert promoters. This is what goes wrong if you give us a crap piano. Give us a good one, please. But they didn't get a musical catastrophe. They got a masterpiece. Keith Jarrett was handed this mess and he embraced it and he soared. <coughs> but I, I want you to think for a moment about Jarrett's initial reaction. He didn't think to himself, this is a great opportunity to, to really stimulate my creative juices. He thought to himself, crap piano, crap concert, I'm not going to do it. And I think that was, that was perfectly natural. It was a mistake, but it's a very understandable mistake. He, he was just being human. Because we all, even adventurous people like Keith Jarrett, you know, we all like things to be the way we want them. If we're going to do a job, we want tools that work. We want reasonable deadlines, reasonable working conditions, not too many distractions, not too many difficult people. And we want everything to be nice and tidy. We want things to be just so. <coughs> and the argument I want to make, which is the argument I make in my book, is that in fact, when things are just so, we very often don't do good work. And when things are a mess, those are the times when we can produce our greatest work. Now, you may at this point be, uh, be saying, well, okay, that's fine if you're Keith Jarrett, but surely this doesn't apply to you and me. Well, maybe. Let me give you a few different perspectives. I'm gonna talk about cognitive psychology, I'm gonna talk about complexity science, social psychology, and a little bit of rock and roll, and I hope that over the course of the next 20 minutes or so, I will have persuaded you that in fact, there is a kind of magic in mess. So let's start with the cognitive psychology. Um, so we've known for a little while that there is such a thing as a desirable difficulty. There are certain kinds of obstacles you put in people's way and they, they overcompensate. Of course, not all the time, but there are certain circumstances where it can happen. So let me give you an example of this. A research that was done six or seven years ago by a team led by Daniel Oppenheimer, psychologist Daniel Oppenheimer. <coughs> what they did was to team up with high school teachers who were you know, handing out uh, course materials. With, you know, they had handouts. You know the kind of thing. So their classes are getting these paper handouts. And the teachers are teaching multiple classes. So... Oppenheimer said, we're going to do a randomized trial. So some of your classes are going to get one kind of handout, and some of your classes are going to get another kind of handout. And here's how the handouts differed. So some classes got handouts 
that were formatted in straightforward fonts, like this is Arial, or Helvetica, Times New Roman. These standard fonts, we all recognize, they're neat, they're tidy, they're easy to read. But then other students, all of their handouts, exactly the same content, but the fonts were different. So the researchers formatted these handouts in monotype Corsiva, which is you know, formatted to look like handwriting. Or Hattenschweiler, very German Hattenschweiler. I mean, it's kind of a cool font, but you wouldn't want to read a novel in Hattenschweiler. Or another, another popular choice, you can see this one coming, yeah? Yeah? Comic Sans italicized, <laughs> with that zesty bounce. So, <laughs> now Comic Sans italicized is an ugly font. Hattenschweiler is not an ugly font, but it is a difficult font. It's dense, it's hard to read. You would think that formatting your homework, formatting your, uh, your course handouts, in these fonts is not going to help. It will be an advantage to have your stuff formatted in Times New Roman or in Arial. But in fact, the end of the semester, the six different subjects being examined, the end of the semester, the exam results come in and the students who've been given the difficult fonts do better in their exams. And you might ask you, yourself, how can this be? And I think the answer is fairly straightforward. If you get a handout in Hattenschweiler, you are going to pay attention. So what is this? And you look and you read, you slow down, you, you're making more connections, you're just reading with a little bit more care and attention. If on the other hand, the thing is formatted in Times New Roman, so easy to read, you kind of feel like you've already read it. Skim across it. So just that, and let me emphasize, it's not a huge disadvantage. It's not a, it wasn't formatted in, web, in wingdings, right? <laughs> so it wasn't an impossible obstacle, but it was just that little, that little kind of stumbling block that actually didn't cause people to stumble at all. It caused them to leap. Well, you might say, I don't trust anything I hear from cognitive psychology these days. All these funny little experiments they do and they don't really know what's going on. And I think you, you might be right to be skeptical. What I try to do in the book is to present arguments using both examples and theories and evidence from, from different disciplines, all pointing in the same direction but from slightly different angles. So let me give you another perspective on what was going on for Keith Jarrett. So maybe the unplayable piano <coughs> Was, was Hattenschweiler for him. It was just a, a, bit, a bit tricky and suddenly he was more alive, he was more alert, he was trying harder. Maybe that was it. Here's another perspective. It comes from complexity science. So in, in maths, there are problems that are very, very difficult to solve. You can solve them, but you just need all the time in the world and all the computing power in the world. So a, a, a very real uh, and present example of these problems is the packing problem. And an example of the packing problem that matters to all of us is trying to fit components on a computer chip. So it turns out you can draw a logical diagram of a computer chip. Well, you, you can't and I can't, but you can get a computer to do it. C computer can say, here's how this brand new chip that we're designing, here's, here's, uh, here's how to lay it out, um, theoretically speaking. But then there's any number of different ways in which practically you could implement that layout on a silicon chip. So when you're just drawing a circuit diagram, it doesn't matter how anything's connected together on a circuit diagram, it's just logical flow. But when you actually have to fit things together on the silicon, it matters a great deal where everything is and how you fit this jigsaw puzzle together. And this is the kind of problem that um, you will never solve well, you, you will solve if you have an infinite amount of time. But you will never solve in a practical amount of time because there are just too many components and too many different combinations, too many ways to wire them all up. And the world is full of problems like this. So you would say, well, how do we solve a problem like this? And the answer is you get a computer to search for solutions. Fortunately, it's not like a, a combination lock with a, a million different digits. Um, you don't have to get the exact answer. You just have to get something that's okay, a, a reasonable answer. 
You don't have to find the very best way to pack the components on this computer chip. You just have to find a way to pack the components on the computer chip that's, that's not too bad, that's reasonably efficient. So you program a computer to start searching for solutions. So what sort of approach would work? How, how would you get a com computer to search for solutions to this sort of problem? Well, lots of different ways to do it. Here's one. It's called the hill climbing algorithm. And an algorithm is basically just a, a recipe, a, a procedure, a set, set of steps that you follow in order to find something. So here's how the hill climbing algorithm goes. It says, OK, um, take a step. Does that step improve the situation? If so, you, that's your new position. And take another step. Does that step improve the situation? If so, that's your new position. Now take another step. Does that step improve the situation? If so, just keep going. And wherever you take a step and it doesn't make things better, you just reverse the step and try a different step. That's the hill climbing algorithm. And the idea is you're blindfolded and you're trying to make your way up Mount Fuji just by looking for, well, which step is uphill? The thing is, if you're on Mount Fuji, that'll work, because Mount Fuji, it's kind of, you know, if you, if you keep going up, you'll get to the top. On the other hand, if you're on a more jagged terrain, what will happen is you, know, you start on some little molehill near Mount Everest, and the hill climbing algorithm just takes you to the top of the molehill, and Mount Everest is up there, but now you're standing on the molehill, every direction is down. So, Hill climbing works if you're on a Mount Fuji problem. But for most problems, it doesn't work because you get stuck. You, know, you, you find improvement and an improvement and an improvement and an improvement. And then finally, you get to a point where there are no steps that improve the situation. There might be giant leaps that improve the situation. There might be radical changes that improve the situation. But from where you are, all modest steps take you back. OK. So there's your complexity science primer. Um, how do we solve that problem then? If, if hill climbing algorithms get stuck, this quest for step-by-step -step improvements gets stuck, how do you break out of the rut? Well, the answer is you add randomness. There are lots of different ways to do this. There are evolutionary algorithms. There are simulated annealing algorithms. There are random restart algorithms. But all, what all these algorithms have in common is some kind of step-by-step -step process, and then some process that keeps going, start again, try something new, take a, take a big risk. And these algorithms perform much better. And this is why we have computer chips that work and that are efficiently packed. Now let's think about Keith Jarrett. Isn't Keith Jarrett in a way, I mean, I know he's a genius, but he's also kind of a hill climbing algorithm, isn't he? He's such a highly skilled magician, uh, musician. He's kind of a magician as well highly skilled musician, he's searching for these ways to get a little bit better and a little bit better and a little bit better, but he always starts in the same place, which is one man, one piano, no rehearsal, away you go. I mean, in some ways, that's tremendously adventurous to do these improvised concerts, but in other ways, you know, it's always a good piano. And a good piano is always, a, it's always the same. And what Vera Brandes and the unplayable piano in uh, the Cohen Opera House did was to give Keith Jarrett this big shove to the side. OK, Keith, do your thing, only don't play any of the top notes, and these eight notes don't work either, and the, the pedals are buggered. And you have to hit it with a mallet. But apart from that, go for it. And it turns out that big sideways shift was exactly what he needed. Now, again, you might say, OK, well, that's, that's fine if you're an algorithm, and it's fine if you're a genius. But what if you're just me? Well, let me give you a totally everyday example. Who here has traveled on the London Underground? You lucky, lucky people. OK. Hopefully none of you came here on the London Underground. So um, you, you think about the London Underground, the problem of, of being a commuter. You may not yet have experienced this position of knowing exactly where to stand on the platform, because that's exactly where the door's going to open. And then when you get off at the other end, you're going to be right by the exit that takes you to... You, when you started commuting for a bit, you start to know the tiniest details about these London Underground stations, and you hone your commuting route to perfection. You're looking for the tiny improvement and the tiny improvement and the tiny improvement. You are a commuting hill-climbing algorithm, and you optimize your route to work. Then you say, well, hang on a minute. What about the random shop? 
how would, you, how would you administer a random shock to commuters? Well, it turns out there's some very nice ladies and gentlemen who work for the trade unions who are happy to do that <laughs> on a periodic basis. And about three years ago, there was a strike, lasted 48 hours, closed two-thirds of London's underground stations. But you could still get around. You could, some of the stations were open, and there were also the buses, and there were also the trains. And as you may know, um, if, you, if you've got an Oyster card, it gets you around the London Underground, you can also use it on the buses. You can also use it on these other modes of public transport. So three economists got hold of the data, and they identified a bunch of commuters... And the def definition of a commuter is you took the same journey every day for two weeks, every weekday for two weeks. If, if you did that, you're a commuter. And then they said, okay, of the commuters, how many of them changed their route on the day of the strike? And the answer is, of course, a lot. And then they said, how many of them didn't change back? And the answer is, tens of thousands didn't change back. Now, obviously, most people went back to their regular route because most people have got their commute nailed. But a substantial minority, 5%, and we're talking about commuters here. Every single step of your journey should be nailed. Turns out, 5% of commuters, given one 48-hour strike, suddenly realized they had been doing it wrong their entire lives. <laughs> so it's not just about these flashes of genius. Sometimes it's just about your... You found a way to do it. It seems like a good way to do it. Somebody gives you a shove and you realize, no, there's actually a better way. And if I'd been more willing to try different things, I might have found that better way sooner. Thank you, Transport and General Workers Union. Um, so, or maybe it was ASLA. I forget. So I said I'd give you a perspective from <coughs> cognitive psychology and I'd give you a perspective from complexity science. I also said I'd talk about social psychology. And this is important because social psychology, I find this very difficult because I'm an economist. And as economist, you know, I, I love numbers. You know, people are difficult. Numbers I love. But social psychologists, they study people. Very hard, very hard subject, uh, people. And, um, and, of course, we're talking about disruptions and frustrations. And there's nothing more frustrating and disruptive than people. So what does social psychology tell us about working with different unusual, uh, or in, in some way uh, challenging people. Well, what it tells us is, number one, we have an incredible tendency to pe seek out people who look like us. So w one, of the, one of the studies that I don't quite believe, but I like, they, they basically took photos of situations like this. You imagine me just taking a snap, and then they just graded how people looked. And they found that basically people sat next to people who were wearing similar clothes, similar hairstyles, similar color hair, etc. So just look around you and, yeah, just saying. Um, <coughs> but more seriously, more, by the way, they found the, same, they found the same behavior in chimpanzees. So, <laughs> so more seriously, it's very well known that people like to hire people who look like them, who think like them, who have similar qualifications, who have similar hobbies. We also know people like to, like to make friends with people who are similar to them. And perversely, the more diverse, one of the studies I, dis I discussed in the book, the more diverse a campus, the more people end up sticking to people exactly like them. And what seems to be going on is if you've got a really big, diverse campus with all kinds of different ethnicities and um, people coming from different parts of the country and different experiences and so on, what you can do is find somebody who's exactly like you and hang out with them. Whereas on a smaller campus where people, there aren't so many differences, you kind of have to compromise and you, your friends are actually a bit more different to you. Very interesting. There's a lot of work in social psychology summarized in a brilliant book by Scott Page called The Difference about how actually if we're able to overcome these tendencies and it form teams with people who think differently to us, who have different experiences, who have different training, different perspectives, we're likely to solve problems better. Not every kind of problem, because some problems are all, all about you know, very, very quick, smooth communication. But most problems have a degree of sort of ex spotting the unexpected and generating new, fresh ideas. And for that, if you have different people in the room, different perspectives in the room, you're more likely to be able to solve problems. 
Now, how do we resolve this tension that on the one hand, we're hanging out with people who are just like us, and on the other hand, people who are not like us help us solve problems? Well, there's a wonderful study done by a psychologist called Catherine Phillips and a couple of her colleagues at Northwestern University. And what she did was to ask people to solve murder mystery problems. So it was a randomized trial, groups of four people, and in one arm of the trial, groups of four people were all friends. And in the other arm of the trial, the groups of four people were three friends plus a stranger, all undergraduates, all at the same university. So you might say, well, they've all got fairly similar perspectives. It's just these people all are already friends, and these people have to get used to this. I mean, it's maximum awkwardness, right? Three friends and a stranger. Trying to have a conversation, this person's there in the corner of the room. The problem that Catherine Phillips gave to the, the students was a murder mystery problem. So here are the police statements, the witness statements, the alibis, photographs of the crime scene. And here is multiple choice. Here are three people who might have done the crime. Who did it, A, B, or C? So um, these are quite hard problems to solve. If you're by yourself trying to solve this, you've got 20 minutes, your chances of success are less than 50%. Which is not great, because if you're a chimpanzee, your chances of success are one third. If, on the other hand, you're together with a group of three like-minded people, a group of four friends, the chances of success nudge up, but not by much. They're just, just over 50%. But with the, group of, the groups of three friends and the stranger, the chances of success went to 75%. It's a big jump in the results. And that's interesting, because no one had any new information. It was just the sheer awkwardness of having to deal with this new person in the room to explain yourself, to, to not be able to let things slide, but to justify your reasoning and be very explicit about your thinking processes. That seems to be what raised the standard of conversation. But what's really interesting is how people felt. So Catherine Phillips asked, asked the people, and when she talked to the groups of four friends, who, remember, had a pretty poor success rate, they were saying, well, yeah, we had a great time, we did really well, yeah, we definitely nailed the guy. Talk to the groups of three friends and a stranger who had a much higher success rate. They were full of doubt. It was very uncomfortable. We don't think we did a good job. See, so here you have a group of people, a diverse group, systematically better able to solve the problem and yet systematically feeling worse about the situation that they were in. That's why the, the perspective that I promised you on rock and roll is, is so important. I, at least I think rock and roll is important. But it's important because of this, this thing that we keep hitting, this resistance to change, this resistance to difficulty. We don't think the unplayable piano is going to help us, and yet it does. So when I was working on the book, um, which, which, by the way, uh, I'm happy to sign copies of outside, great Christmas presents uh, for the messy person in your life. We've got the local bookshop has come here, the Warwick Campus Bookshop has come here to sell you copies, so I'm very happy to oblige. Um, where was I? Yeah. When I was writing the book, one person I really wanted to interview was a musician, one of my favorite musicians. And I didn't think he would agree to speak to me. But as it happens, he was delighted. Because he's fascinated by the use of random disruptions in music. His name is Brian Eno. At, the, at this point, half of you were going, who's Brian Eno? And the other half were going, oh, Brian Eno, it's amazing. So, just to explain to the benighted half of you who the heck Brian Eno is. Eno uh, got his start with Rox Roxy Music. So in the early 70s, he was dressed as a wizard, playing keyboards with a gigantic <coughs> plastic knife and fork. Uh, then he left Roxy Music and he, um, he made an album called Another Green World, which Prince said is the album that most inspired him. He then created ambient music, this amazing new sonic aesthetic. And he worked with, with Philip Glass and with Milos Forman and with Twyla Tharp and with Devo and with Gavin Bryars and all these sort of great composers and artistic figures. But he's also worked with some really seriously big rock groups because they realize that Eno, as a producer or as a collaborator, is able to somehow give them something that they, that they don't have by themselves. <coughs> so he's worked with Coldplay. He's worked with U2. Worked with a gentleman called David Bowie you may have heard of. 
He worked on, on Bowie's three great albums that were, that were made in Berlin, Heroes, Lodger, and Low. And what all of these people want from Brian Eno, they want him to make a mess. They want him to, to be that source of creative disruption, to be the ugly font, to be the awkward stranger in the room. That's what he specializes in. And one of the things that he does is he has this deck of cards called the Oblique Strategies. And he'll just shuffle them and draw one at random. And it will say something like, not building a wall, making a brick. Oh. Everyone was like, oh, what does that mean, Brian? And he will say, well, you must simply face the truth of the card. And everyone is, has to figure out what, or it'll be, <coughs> concentrate on the most embarrassing detail and amplify it. Or it will say, everybody swap instruments. That's great, you've got a brilliant guitarist in the studio and you put him on the drums. And the, the musicians, I have to be clear, the musicians hated this. Absolutely hated it. So Phil Collins played the drums on Another Green World. He was reduced to hurling beer cans across the studio in frustration. Carlos Alomar, great rock guitarist, Carlos Alomar, who was working on these Berlin albums. He, he, he said, oh, the music sounds like crap, the experiment is stupid. These cards, it's like being slapped in the face. And yet somehow, the results appeared, and they were amazing. And then much, much later, the musicians started to acknowledge, actually, maybe there was something in it. But Carlos Alomar now teaches guitar in New York, and he makes his students draw oblique strategies cards. He says, he says I need them to feel what I felt, to know that they're going to get stuck and they have to get through it. He had a wonderful comment on the documentary about Bowie's life called Five Years. He said, yeah, those cards, they took me to another place. And to be honest, I didn't like the place. But when I came back, I was fresh. So maybe there was something in them. So Eno says, that the, the friend of creative work is attention. And when you're being put in this stressful situation by this, the ugly font, the unplayable piano, the awkward stranger, you are paying attention. And the situation may be difficult, it may be causing you anxiety, but because you're paying attention, you're starting to do some of your best work. But he also recognized, we will resist. We don't want to put ourselves... I don't like meeting strangers. I'm an economist. I don't want to talk to strangers. I don't want to, I don't want to sort of break my computer. I don't want to have to function in intolerable conditions. Nobody wants to do this. And so very often we have to be forced. And that's why they were a deck of cards. So the oblique strategies originally were just a, a list of ideas on the wall. But that didn't work, because Eno realized you go down the list and you just pick whatever is the least disruptive, whatever is not going to inconvenience you, which, of course, misses the point entirely. And that's why it had to be a random shuffle. It had to be a deck of cards. Draw one and obey it. Because that's the only way to get us to face up to this kind of stress. And I think that's a challenge for all of us. It doesn't have to be a card. It, it could be just that we, through sheer willpower, we force ourselves to go out and, and start working with somebody totally new or going to a new place. Or it, it, it could be that we're, we're just backed into the situation. It could be a guilt trip from a German teenager. But somehow, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to prod us into the situation, all of us from time to time need to sit down and try and play the unplayable piano. I'm very happy to take questions, but thank you all very much for coming, and thank you for listening. <laughs> so, any, raise your hands if you have a question. Yeah, uh, there's a question here. Do we have microphones, or are we just going to yell? I'm going to take that as we do not have microphones. Please just yell, sir.
sample sizes and like how certain we can assure that the difference in the performance is due to the font and not to anything else? So it's a very it's a very good question. I do not actually believe any individual study I read these days at all. So I'm always looking to try to um, to put all of these studies in the round. So if somebody, somebody shows me a result these days that, and I think, wow, that's just amazing, I can't quite believe that's true, it's probably not true. But if somebody shows me a study and, and that fits in with a whole bunch of other things and other perspectives that I have from different studies from different fields, then I start to say, okay, well, maybe, maybe it is true. So if the font study it also echoes what we, hear, what we find out from complexity science, if it also echoes what we find out from social psychology, from studies of groups, uh, decision-making and juries and so on, then I start to believe it. There may be a meta-analysis coming soon. I haven't seen a meta-analysis, but um, that's what ultimately we want. The reason I think you're right to, to, to raise the issue in general is there was this remarkable comment made by Daniel Kahneman in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. He was talking about uh, a study where if you um, make people hold a pencil between their teeth, it makes them uh, smile. And then uh, you get them to do something, and then you get them to, to say how happy they're feeling. You actually make them feel happier because you made them smile. And he said, well, you may not believe this result, but you have no choice because the statistics are incontrovertible. Well, it turns out the statistics are not incontrovertible. The statistics don't, don't stack up at all. Um, but we, he didn't know that. No, nobody knew that at the time he wrote. Then the issue we're starting to find with a lot of psychological research, to a lesser extent economic research, it seems to be particularly at the moment uh, a problem with psychology, is fairly small sample sizes. Uh, and in a way, more important than the small sample size is very messy uh, measures of... You no, know, messy is good. Very, <laughs> very noisy um, measures of success. So you're, you're testing this famous uh, study of... Um, uh, power poses, so you pose like this, or you pose like this, and it makes you, makes you feel great and raises your testosterone level. Well, it turns out there's a lot of noise in measurements of testosterone level, and that research appears to have evaporated as well. And if you've got a, a lot of noise and a reasonably small sample size, the only way you can actually get statistical significance is if something crazy has happened. So we now need larger samples, we need more uh, repetition of experiments, more attempts to replicate. Psychology is doing a great job of this now. And also, maybe the thing that doesn't get enough attention is uh, very high-quality measurements of, what, of output. If you have a very noisy measurement of output, it's very, very difficult to be confident in anything. But if you can get a really good, tight measurement of, of outcomes and, and what you've got, and less noisy measures, they can actually start to detect smaller effects. So... You are, you are right to be sceptical. And I would not be surprised if any individual study in this book sh shows out on further uh, inspection not to stack up, because this is what we've come to expect. But when, they're, when you've got a theoretical approach, uh, when you've got data from one scientist and data from another scientist and different studies, and they're all starting to point in the same direction, then I start to take that seriously. Yeah. So there's certainly a tendency, and this is, I think, happening in Syria, there's certainly a tendency for people to use disorder as a weapon, to use chaos as a weapon. And there is a, there's a chapter on this in the book. The case studies, I don't talk about Islamic State or Syria. I do talk about Erwin Rommel, the German tank commander. I talk about Jeff Bezos, the head of Amazon. And I talk about a guy called Donald Trump. I'm not, I haven't followed what's happened to him recently. But in, in each case, uh, these were, and I also talk about a guy called, um, uh, called uh, Sterling, who, who founded the SAS. 
So um, in each case, these are people who they face a tendency of we, the, these are the, it's a competitive situation that we want to control. So we want we want scripts and they, and rehearsals and we want to understand we want with politics we want our focus groups with commando action we need a, a large team and lots of reconnaissance and good maps and we really need to understand what's you know, the lay of the land with business and we need a very clear business plan and and a top team in place and to prepare the ground and in each case what these people said was no no if we just act really really quickly um, okay we won't have a clue what's going on it'll be utter chaos we won't be able to control the situation at all but at least we'll have the element of surprise and the people that we're competing against well may well be more discomforted th than we are Bezos was very explicit about this in the early years of Amazon it's like we haven't got a clue but I, I can assure you that Barnes and Noble have even less of a clue and as long as we keep moving then the competitive advantage lies with us so I don't necessarily endorse it I mean I'm not a great fan of Nazi um, tank commanders um, but he was, a, he was a really good general. He was very, very effective. Just looking around. Uh, yeah. Yeah? Um, given they've got policy, it's entirely the first century, they can constrain themselves. So I want to write a really used the example of poetry when I spoke to him but he um, so the, the the idea of the beautiful constraint is a familiar one you know had a slightly different take on it which I found interesting which was he said think about a poetry with a rhyming scheme is it's it's very very structured in some ways you would think it's a very tidy scheme but the structure in one way creates disorder in another way so if you say for example Oh, her hair was beautiful and red. I need to think of something that rhymes with red. Fled, dead, instead, bled. And, and there's, suddenly you've got this, this search down your list of words that end in ed. And that search is completely orthogonal to the meaning of red. So the, what appears to be a highly predictable form, and it is predictable in some ways, uh, forces you to search in, in completely unpredictable ways. Uh, along another angle. So I think you're right, but I, I, it hadn't occurred to me until I spoke to Eno that one of the things that these, these structures are doing is, is by constraining you in one way, they're forcing you to improvise in another way. Yeah, gentlemen, the, the hat. So I have three children. <laughs> um, it, it's a good question. How much order is too much? I think we all know people who have too much disorder in their lives and live too messily. My general observation is that I can't prove this, but I, th I think it's true. I argue that it's true, but I can't prove it. Is that most of us err on the side of too much tidiness, too much structure, too much preparation. Uh, how, how many times have you shown up to a, a, a talk, for example, and, you've, and you, you're like, oh, great, they, they've, they've typed out everything, or there are loads and loads of bullet points, this is going to be a great talk, versus somebody who just shows up and appears to wing it. And you can, you can prepare too little, but you can also structure far too much. And my impression is people tend to structure too much. They tend to try to control the situation too much, to quantify too much, to label too much, to organize too much. And so I would argue just a bit of a, a little bit of disorder, a little bit more improvisation, a little bit less structure for most people in most situations is probably a step in the right direction. But give it a try and see. And you, you want to search for safe spaces to do that. I, by, by the way, an example of how technology can Technology can tidy things up, but technology can create safer spaces too, is um, Hollywood comedies. So Hollywood comedies used to be highly scripted, and now they're all improvised. Well, why is that? Is it because suddenly improv's cool? Is it suddenly you know, the, the actors are more willing to improvise? No. The thing that's changed is the technology. Now you can just... Digital cameras, they're cheap. You can have lots of them, lots of different angles. Film, 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 film. 
just improvise, 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 keep riffing. And then the editing software is really good as well. So you can give some poor guy hours of footage and just say, just pick the, the funny 45 seconds out of this, stitch it all together and make it work. And so the technology, because it, it enables you to produce a tidier result, you can have a much, much messier process. How do I do it? Um, I'm not sure I do it as much as I should, but that's, that's part of the point. But one thing that I do a lot that I discuss in chapter two of the book is multitasking for, for creative inspiration. Now, when I say multitasking, I should emphasize I am not talking about the Twitter. I do not advise using the Twitter while you're trying to do something else. It's extremely distracting. I'm not, not talking about multi-screening or any of that kind of stuff. What I'm talking about is having several projects on at the same time. The more than one essay, more than one course, uh, more than one book. So halfway through Messi, I stopped and I wrote a book called The Undercover Economist Strikes Back. And then I started Messi again. Just to give you a sense of how the multitasking process goes. And I didn't really understand what was going on at the time. But and then I came to be writing what became chapter two. And a number of studies have been done of highly creative people, novelists, scientists, everyone from Jane Austen to, to Charles Darwin, lots of people who won Nobel Prizes, by different psychologists using different methods. And they all find the same thing, which is uh, very creative people are multitaskers. So they will have one project and then they'll stop and they'll switch to another project, maybe in a different field, they'll work on that for a bit and they'll switch back to the first project. Then they get bored with that or they get stuck and then they'll move to a third project. Then they go back to the second project and then back to the third project. Then, and then they're working on the third project and the first project. And, and out of this comes the origin of species, for instance. And there are different things going on it's partly the psychological relief of you've, you've got stuck and, and at least you've got something else to do. But I think it's partly also the cross-fertilization of projects. So things that we regard as a distraction, sometimes they're a distraction, but sometimes they're just a new perspective grist to the creative mill. So the thing I do most and that I find most easy to do in terms of embracing the ideas in the book uh, is to have multiple projects going on at the same time. Uh, yeah, just, we've got time for one more question. So, you, sir. Any advice on being a writer? Do I have any advice on being a writer? Um, I think I have advice, but I don't think any of the advice is, is brilliant and original. So, you should read a lot. You should read people you admire. You should read a variety of people. You should think about how they're doing what they're doing. What did they have to go through to produce the effects that they're producing, whether they're, it's fiction or non-fiction? You should write a lot. Uh, these days, anyone can write on, on a blog, on, on Facebook, online. You can just write and write and write. It doesn't matter. It's, anybody in the world can read what you write, or nobody can read. Uh, and that, that's a wonderful thing. It would have been very difficult, uh, even 20 years ago, to, to get that kind of platform. Um, and then, in terms of actually trying to be a published writer, which is a, was not your question, but maybe is something you're also interested in, writing and writing gives you a body of work that you can share with people, you can show what you've done. You get, you get better, you start to get feedback. And ultimately, when you're trying to, um, if you're trying to say publish a book these days, people will want to see a big body of work. They'll want to see evidence you can actually produce a sustained output rather than just, hey, I've got this great idea for a book, will you publish the book? When I published Undercover Economist, well, when I wrote Undercover Economist, I wrote it without a publisher, without an agent. When I finished the first draft, I remember going downstairs to, to say to my then girlfriend, she's now my wife, we've been married 13 years, so it dates this. I said, I've just finished the first draft of the book. I'm so glad I wrote it. I don't know if anybody will ever read it, but I'm glad I wrote it. And I think that's, you need to have that sort of feeling if you're ever going to get through a book. Because most books are not published, and most published books are not really read by very many people and don't make a lot of money and don't get much of an audience. But if you love writing, that's its own reward. And so I, I urge everybody to have some kind of creative outlet 
doesn't matter if anybody's watching, if anybody's listening, if anybody's reading. It's nice if they do. It's nice to get feedback. It's nice to be paid. But ultimately, it's great to create. And that's where you start. Speaking of getting paid, <laughs> there are books outside. Um, you don't have to buy one, but I'm, if you're thinking of Christmas presents, I'm very happy to sign away. Um, thank you for your patience at the be beginning of the lecture. Thank you all for coming. It's been great. And Merry Christmas. Thank you.